Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Success Insight podcast. Our guest is Nathan Aganaga. Nathan is a U.S. Army retired master sergeant and author of Division, Life on Ardan Street. Division tells the story of Nathan's life on Ardan Street from the time he arrived in 1994 to when he finally left in 2005. Nathan, welcome to the Success Insight podcast. Good morning, Howard. Thank you for having me. So, Nathan... As a retired military master sergeant, I'm sure you have a lot of stories to tell, but if you perhaps first could share a little bit about your background and, you know, what was the the defining moment when you decided, I want to make the military, the army a a part of my life? So I, I think our listeners would like to learn a little bit about that backstory before we get into the book. Please share. Sure, Howard. Well, to be honest with you, I was a little boy and... I, was, I think I was in fifth grade. I was about 10 years old, and we didn't have cable television back then, but the movie The Deer Hunter aired on regular television, and I think we had, what, three or four channels back in those days? Oh, yeah. And so they had they had the movie The Deer Hunter, in case your listeners don't have never seen it before. It's a Vietnam War movie with Robert De Niro, and so they had it on regular television because they had won so many Academy Awards, and so our family all got together, and we watched it, and in between the commercials, they would even warn, you know, due to violence and and language, this movie's not meant for certain viewers or whatever. But I tell you what, I watched that movie and Robert De Niro's character, when they got captured in Vietnam and how they escaped the prison camp, his character and his leadership is what drove me as a young boy to want to join the military. I remember looking at that character of De Niro and I said, when I grow up, I want to be like that guy. And so basically that was it. So ever since I was a little boy, fifth grade or so, I had my heart set on joining the military. So when you graduated high school, or perhaps maybe even prior to the graduation of high school, had you actually put this idea or this desire in motion to go down to the local recruiting office? How did that next piece of the journey take place? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think it was my junior year of high school that I went ahead and enlisted into the delayed entry program. And back in those days, you actually had to have your parents sign because I wasn't 18 yet. So yeah, I was already scheduled. And then May of 1990, I graduated high school. And that July, I left for basic training. What did your parents think about this idea? I'm like, our son is going off to the military. I mean, it's, and and some of us, our parents want us to be doctors, lawyers, accountants, take over the family business. And here you are, you know, your mindset and you're, you're going off to the, for military training. I tell you, my parents were supportive. They always were because they knew that it was in my heart from the time I was a young child that I wanted to go be a soldier. They supported me the whole way and all the way through my 20 years in, in the military. It was a really good journey. I had 100% support from the parents. Fantastic. And beyond the parents, did you have other role models in addition to the movie depiction, you know, Robert De Niro's character, but other role models that maybe not helped inform you because you'd already had your mind up, but helped inform you about this is the life you're about to enter into? Because I imagine some people don't take it lightly. Well, yes, absolutely. I had friends and family. My grandfather served in World War II in the Marine Corps. I had other friends, older brothers that had been in the Marines, dads that were in Vietnam. That era of growing up in the 80s, a lot of the parents you know, were in their 30s and maybe early 40s, but they were all, a lot of them were Vietnam veterans. And so I had a lot of mentoring prior to, not just by the recruiters, but friends and family that were still around that could tell me what I was about to get into. But I pretty much already knew it was a strong disciplinary way of life. I was prepared. Fantastic. And just a a little note of sharing with you, Nathan, if I could have turned back, if I could turn back the hands of time, I should have gone into the military right after high school. I think that would have been fantastic for me. I'm not saying it would have been the Army or the Marines or the Navy or Air Force or whoever it would have been. Probably not the Coast Guard because I'm 
not a big swimmer, but I think that would have been a fantastic decision. And it sounds like you you made an excellent decision. And so now you're in the Army and you're on the way eventually into, into the 82nd Airborne. So you've written this book about this journey, Life on Our Den Street. And so first of all, for our listeners, tell us about the title of the book, Division, Life on Our Den Street. What is, what is that? Okay, well, division is how we describe the 82nd Airborne Division, okay? Most people, especially if you've been assigned there and throughout the Army as a whole, it's referred to as just simply division. And so, to be honest with you, when I first wrote this book, the manuscript, it was just called division. And then I always had the idea that I was going to have the 82nd Airborne symbol on the front, and that would let all the readers understand exactly what I was talking about. Especially nowadays, when you say the word division, you think of political divide in our country or whatever. So I I wanted, I just wanted that on the cover. Well, when I got with John Kohler, the president of a publishing company, he actually told me, he's like, you know, why don't you, why don't you go into it a little more, explain it on the title, add something to it. And, you know, while I was doing my telephonic interview with him, because this was my first book, it actually just hit me immediately. I said, okay, I'll just call it life on our dentistry division, life on our dentistry. And he said, that's excellent. And I said, that, that describes it all right there. And that's what the book's premise is, is, is not necessarily, this is not a war book. So I hope your listeners don't expect to read Black Hawk Down or something to that effect. Because my war stories don't even compare to those anyway. But I wanted to just pinpoint this down to the everyday living experience from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed of, of how the life is in the 82nd Airborne Division. And I really, I really don't think a lot of people out there understand that it's a rapid deployment unit, that it's, it's not your regular conventional infantry unit. And I, and I suspect, too, and I think I, I read somewhere in, in one of the highlights about the book, and th- this is a t- 24 by 7 lifestyle, in addition to being extremely rapid deployment. Where, by the way, is our Den Street located? Okay, Arden Street is on Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and it is the actual main strip of the home of the 82nd Airborne Division, at least back in my day. I know now it's extended a little bit around on, on other streets as well, Long Street, such. Back in the day, the 82nd Airborne Division, the main strip was Arden Street. And on Arden Street is where you do all your, your running in the morning, all your physical training, they close the road down for, for physical fitness training. And then by, I believe, 8 o'clock in the morning, they open it up to traffic. 7.30 or 8, they can open it up to traffic, and then you can go back to driving on it. But uh, that's generally what our den street is, the main strip of the 82nd Airborne Division. How long is it? I'm curious. Oh, well, it's the portion with the 82nd covers about a mile and a half. Well, like I said, it used to right. in the book description. Then you have other units on it, but our den street itself is approximately oh three to four miles because it goes all the way down to a connecting road called Riley Street. So, so. you your your life on this street is it, it, unless you're deployed somewhere else, it's you're you're on that street every day while you're you're training it, it, at Fort Bragg. When you're in garrison, absolutely, and then and then that doesn't include the time. And I I describe all this as well. When you go conduct field training exercises, or you're in, actually in a school, or you're actually deployed to combat, you're basically right. Every you know when you're in garrison doing weapons maintenance or whatever your mission is for the barracks, you're you're doing PT, and and yeah, you're 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 usually running three to five miles a day on our den street. Okay. Back in those days. Okay. And I'm sure it hasn't changed much today as well. I um, guarantee it hasn't. I, I was going to ask you at some point in our conversation, how has the 82nd changed? And, you know, perhaps we'll go into that. But as, when you enlisted and now you're you're at boot camp, it's, you know, 1990-ish, 94 is when you came onto our Den Street. What is it like for a 20-something, a very young 20 two, 23-year-old kid coming into what is an extremely storied history of military life for this country because it's been the division has been around since World War One. So what's it like coming into this kind of environment as a 20-something-year-old? Oh, I tell you, I specifically re-enlisted for it 
My original job in the Army, believe it or not, and I described this in the beginning of the book, was a 71 Lima. That's what the nomenclature for the, the, the occupational skill was, and that's administrative specialist. So I worked with typing and, and clerical stuff. That was my first job, my first four years in the Army. So not only was the world of Fort Bragg surreal to me, but I had changed my job over to infantry when I re-enlisted. My first duty assignment on Fort Bragg, I had, I had also changed over to what they call 11 Bravo, which is light infantry. And so the entire lifestyle change as a whole was completely different. I was proud of it. that I specifically re-enlisted to go to uh, the 82nd Airborne Division on Fort Bragg. And I tell you, I wouldn't change it for nothing. Well, I can imagine you've stayed in for you know, 20, 20 years. And so when you made... The change. So you're in the you're in the service for three to four years. Had it always been you, the back of your mind? I'm going to make this change, or I'm going to reenlist, and I want to make this transfer over to the 82nd and be in 11 Bravo. Had, had that been a constant reminder for you, or had you had conversations with perhaps your your superiors? Okay, what do I need to do to get this, make this happen? What kind of conversations were you having? Well, you know, I worked a lot with the reenlistment non commissioned officer because I came from Germany, and so he basically told me, "It's like, okay, do you know what you're getting into? Are you sure you want to do this?" And I said, absolutely. I said, I always wanted to be infantry. As a matter of fact, when I first enlisted, that was back in the day where if you failed the color vision test, because I'm partially colorblind. I mean, I can see color, but from a certain distance, certain shades look, look the same to me, Sure, uh, like red or green or something to that effect, blue or purple. But anyways, so I failed the color vision test, and it was the old test where you had the circles and you had to depict the number inside the circle with the colors. And I, I had failed that. So I couldn't go combat arms back in those days. And so I had to pick a, a what they call a soft skill MOS, a military occupational skill. When I re-enlisted, I took my physical and they actually had changed it where a machine came down over your head. And you basically just had to tell them what color was red and which color was green. And so that's how I was able to be able to have my dream of being a, an infantryman and more so a paratrooper in the 82nd. That was fortuitous with the advantage of having the the technology there for you. So now you've arrived on our dance street. You're this newbie, for the sake of a better word. You're you're an experienced soldier, but you're you're new. What what is life like for somebody coming right in? It was an eye-opener. And there were some nights where I would sit there in bed in, in the barracks, and I'd say to myself, what did I get myself into? This lifestyle is crazy. And I tell you, Howard, you didn't mess around back in those days. If you were told to knock out 25, 30, 40 push-ups, you just did it. You didn't give no mouth back. You'd have a young 21, 22-year-old sergeant over you. There'd be some colorful language that you would be called to as well. So I guess you can only imagine. You know, I there's a, the actor. I cannot remember his name, but I can picture his voice. He's in a lot of the... Uh, I guess the 80s, 90s war movies. He even had a cable show where he's on the, on the tank. But it, it, so the person that this, the sergeant, 20 something year old sergeant hovering over you to do those push ups, is he, he or she? Or maybe it was still he back then. I imagine they're she's now. Yeah, are they leaning over you, yelling? What's, come on, soldier. I mean, what's it like to be yelled at like that and knowing you better do it or else? It gets pretty mind-boggling at times, you know. But but what's funny about it is when you progress and then you become that sergeant someday, like I like I talk about in the book as well, and then how I get there and the, the hardships that I go through or, or that, you know, young soldiers have gone through. And then you transition that and, and you understand at that point that, especially in the infantry, it's, it's, a, it's a do or die environment. You know, you either follow orders or, you know, you could be shot and killed or, or it's so there's, there's no really gray area. And I'll be honest with you. I, I didn't have a problem with it because that was an E4. Like, you, you know, like I, I said, I was a little bit more experienced, but I was always uh, how we described it. I was always squared away. Like, I, I guess my sergeants didn't really have to, to get on me too much. 
but I, I seen other, other kids in the barracks and I tell you, they'd get on them in a heartbeat. And I'm sure to this day, I mean, I left 15 years ago, but I, I, I guess to this day, I, I pretty much guarantee it's the same way, the discipline. Sure. And when the sergeant is not getting on you, he's getting on somebody else. Does that also mean that the sergeant is perhaps setting you up for perhaps additional opportunities to, you know, in the business world, we have assignments, you know, a leader, you know, we have a conversation and, the, and this leader thinks, oh, how would it be great for that project? Let's, let's let him do it. Is that happening in the military when, you know, okay, maybe you're not the center of attention and getting yelled at. The, the, the sergeant is, co- is confident. I wouldn't say they're comfortable. They're confident that Nathan is a, is a, a straightforward guy we can give him additional responsibilities. Is that type of interaction happening? Sure. Just like the business world back in those days, if you were a performer, you could produce uh, excellent results. Then sure. Reward, re- reward would always follow with either promotion or more responsibilities of, of your duties. Absolutely. So what was the, the path then to go from the, you know, you're 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 in the division. You're out there with your your peers, and now there's the opportunity to get this promotion. Was it somebody saying, "Hey, Nathan, there's a there's an opening for a, 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 another uh, master sergeant," or maybe there's does, does a sergeant come before master sergeant? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, and then master sergeant or first sergeant with that. Okay, absolutely. so you, so you had to go through that path too. Oh, absolutely. That's that's actually the nucleus of this book, going from bottom to top. What I had to go through, and what every paratrooper, young soldier, has to go through to get from you know point A to point B or point A to point Z, if you will, uh, to get up to that to that top level. That's the best feeling of the book is actually how I progressed in that and what it took the hardships and what it, what it, responsibilities it really took and the schools that you have to graduate from also. So let's talk a little bit about those three, the hardship responsibility and then the, the education. As you are progressing, again, we don't want to share too much because we want people to go out and get the book, Division Life on Our Den Street. But what are <laughs> some of the tidbits that you can share with our audience about the, those progressions? Let's start with a little bit of the hardships. When you go from E4 to E5, you have to go to a, what they call a promotion board. And normally, you know, you you sit there in front of a, a board of about five first sergeants and a command sergeant major. Normally, it's your battalion. And then they'll just drill you with questions. And normally, they have these once a month. And if you pass that board, then you were what they called promotable. And then back in those days, you had to graduate from a, a, an academy called the Primary Leadership Development Course. And it was a school basically training young sergeants. And, and that was about a month long. And once you, once you graduated from that, if you made what they called the cutoff score back in those days, and I'm sure it's the same way now, then you got promoted to sergeant. And what that would mean then in, in the infantry is you would be duty-wise promoted to the, to the position of team leader, fire team leader. And in an infantry squad, you have two fire team leaders and an overall a squad leader, a staff sergeant over, over the whole squad, which is about nine infantrymen. And then within a platoon, you have four squads. And I, I made it all the way up from sergeant all the way up to eventually master sergeant. In division, I, I explained going all the way up to a platoon sergeant position and finishing that successfully. I'm curious, in you don't come across to me as the type of guy that has a lot of negative self-talk. I mean, that's something... You know, there's a, in, even in, in my profession as a coach, there's this topic called uh, imposter syndrome. You know, am I should I really be here? And then that that kind of just kind of feeds the the self talk if, we, if we're not careful, or or a limiting belief. Was there ever a time where you kind of said I shouldn't really be here, but I am, or? this is not going to work out. Was there ever that type of mindset? Cause you don't come across as that type of guy. It's like you're, you're in. absolutely. Uh, there were times, there were absolutely were times where, you know, I questioned, um, whether or not I was going to get fired the next day. 
you know, because I, I, I have, you know, a certain platoon sergeant or a squad leader over me. And, you know, I also explain, you know, one of my biggest fears, not just in the military, but in life in general, one of my biggest fears isn't combat or jumping out of airplanes or repelling down the side of a mountain. My biggest fear was failure. I did I never wanted to fail my responsibilities. And that, and to this day, that's, I have the biggest fear of, I don't want to fail. And so that, that's the drive that kept me going through all, all those years. And um, particularly in the 82nd airborne division, because you constantly had leaders that were telling you, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, or you're going to go to ranger school, or you're going to go to jump master school, or I'm going to fire you. And, you know, I get into detail of that, you know, and, and of course, eventually I, I go to those schools and I, I graduate and I move up, you know, it's, it's so it's a journey. It's a very, it's a, it's a journey that could stress you out, but it's also a, a reward. You make yourself proud of you, you know, you're, you're proud of yourself you know, and others around you. What were the, I don't know, the, the re- rewards or behaviors or acknowledgements when you were getting stressed, you were having these self-doubts and, and wondering, should I be here or I'm going to get fired? What were those rewards that really made you think, I'm where I need to be? Oh, it's obviously the duty position, you know, increasing the the duty position, you know, going to going to become a squad leader or going to become that platoon sergeant, being ranger qualified, because then you you know, you're part of the you feel like part of the club, I guess is the overall answer. Yeah. That's probably the best answer. Is you, you feel you feel as if you're part of the part of the elite club. You made it. You made it to the top. And that's the biggest reward, you know, that you can get in that environment. And I was very proud to to, to say that I was one of those guys. I'm still proud of it. You know, there are individuals who get into major universities. And here in Chicago, we have University of Chicago, Northwestern. And when I'm doing career coaching with them, there's some self-doubt because they're, they're in the middle of a transition that, you know, they're not used to having to look for a new job. And I kind of described to them is you, you actually have a business card available to you or, in some cases, I've even used the the metaphor, the golden ticket. I don't know if you ever remember Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but you've got oh, this, absolutely, yeah, you've got this degree from Northwestern University of Chicago, and you have the business card, one of a few business cards that are available in the in the armed services. So there's, there's there's perhaps some in the Navy and in the Marines, the Air Force, Coast Guard, etc. But you have you know, the, the Ranger School, the, the 82nd, those are like line items on a business card. And it, it creates opportunities for you, not only in terms of the conversations that you can have, but the people who are coming to you for advice, you know, for, in, for your insights. I'm curious, with this journey that you've taken, when you have an opportunity, and I guess I should ask, do you have the opportunity today to have conversations with young kids who are considering or, or contemplating my best course of action after or decision I can make after high school is to go into the military. Are you having those kinds of conversations today with, with kids? Oh, absolutely. When I did my master's degree a few years back, when I was doing my internship with the, with the school counselor, he well, I also I actually set up classroom time for me to talk to some of the seniors or, or some of the juniors in high school of the, the career path of the military. And not only do I have experience with that, but I also have experience with training young officers because I was an ROTC evaluator and trainer for uh, instructor for uh, Bowling Green State University Army ROTC. So I also had that path if they wanted to find out how to get contracted and perhaps have the military pay for their, their bachelor's degree. But then, of course, you know, you owe the Army, I think, four years, you know, as a lieutenant, as, you know, and you go right in as a leader. So I, another privilege that I had, not as a recruiter, but as an instructor at Army ROTC. And that's the unit I actually got assigned to when I left the 82nd Airborne Division. You know, I, I as I'm listening to you, Nathan, I'm thinking, I wish I, I, wish I had made some of these decisions 
a little differently <laughs> when I was a lot younger. I mean, I think I'm in the perfect place right now. I get to coach individuals, you know, teams about leadership and problem solving and get to help people with their career. The, that military experience, that the, the, the ability to, you know, really test yourself, your mettle, who you are, what you're capable of, is just a wonderful opportunity that we don't often get. And I would like to say, I mean, you're, you're, you're as a role model, I mean, it's just, it's wonderful to hear you and have you share with our audience how special the, and that's not a soft special, but a hard special. This experience was for you. With uh, this book, Division Life on Our Den Street, I mean, this is just, is this just, is this the full story or are there other stories that you anticipate being associated with this? Oh, absolutely. And that's, as your listeners read Division, uh, they're going to find out that there's openings within some of the chapters where I don't necessarily cover the entire story. For for example, I go into a story, my experience in Army Ranger School at Fort Benning, Georgia. I, I go into when I pass the physical fitness test to, to, to begin the school to I, I fast forward to the final mission in Florida where I leave the school. So there's an opening in there. And just to let the cat out of the bag now, for your listeners, the second book is about my experience just in Ranger School. And that comes out, that's already been contracted, and that'll come out this May or June. And so the, the point is in division, there's, a, there's openings in there. And I'm actually writing my third one now because this is a three-book series. Okay. And so, yes, there are openings. Yes. Okay. I'm curious, and in, in, there is another paragraph that I had had prepared, and if I had decided in the introduction to state it, but I think it's a good spot right now is – you know, this is the journey of you uh, in the 82nd and all the, for the sake of a be- of a metaphor, the harbors along the way that you're going to stop in, the ranger training, parachuting, leadership, et cetera. Somewhere along that route, that path, that journey, you got married. Being the partner, spouse of a someone in the service, that's not an easy life. How? No, not at all. How did that, perhaps that's book number four, you know, there, I, I have a friend whose husband is a officer in, in the Marines and, and every couple of years they, they change duty locations and she runs an, uh, an entrepreneurial business. And I know it's, you know, it's not an easy life for both of them. But what was it like? Also, not you've got responsibility to the to the uh, to the, the the army. You've got responsibility to the men and women that that serve under you, and now you have a responsibility to your spouse. And then eventually, you've you've got a college age daughter and, and a son that's going to graduate high school. How is how does that impact this journey that you were on? Well, I tell you, it's uh, that's the roughest part because you're gone all the time. So your spouse takes on the responsibility. And I'm sure your listeners aren't already understand this, but your spouse, she'll take on the responsibility uh, or he will take on the responsi- responsibility of taking care of the family while you're gone. And it, it might not necessarily be combat. You could be gone. We were gone all the time, two or three weeks in, the, in what we call in the field, training in a field exercise or deployed to a training exercise or deploy to a month down in Hurricane Katrina relief, which I talk about extensively. And I'll tell you, uh, it takes a toll on the family. And a lot of families don't make it. The marriages, they don't make it. And I've seen a lot of it. And actually, to be honest with you, I had been divorced to my kid's mother. And that was primarily it because, especially for the year of 2003 to 2005, uh, our last couple years together, and I talk about this also in, in division, the direct hardships of being gone. I was gone all the time. I, I graduated ranger school, and two weeks later, I was gone for six months to Iraq or eight months. And I tell you, it, it, was, uh, it was a rough journey, and it will take a toll on families. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent that you've included it in the book, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, our listeners who are part of a, a military family that would you know, welcome hearing what you have to say. And, and even, and, and I also know that there are support groups out there for, you know, spouses of 
you know, military uh, fam- spouses who are in the military. So somehow I think people don't really, there are those that understand it, but perhaps aren't even prepared for what that impact is going to be on the relationship. When you... Sure. Now that you're an accomplished author, you got book number two is finishing up. Book number three is kind of in the planning stage. As a retired Army Master Sergeant, what would you say to 20-something Nathan Aganaga if you could tell him today about what his life is going to be like? I would tell 21-year-old Nathan Aganaga, you just keep driving on and do what you what you plan on doing. And I wouldn't change it for the world, Howard. I would maintain everything that I have that I've done or failed to do. I would do it all over again just because it, it, it all ended up being successful at the end. Is there something in that statement that you could add? And it doesn't have to be, but I'm curious. If you could do something different, and not, not that you would make... Not that you wouldn't go down this path and make all those decisions, but is there something you wish you had done maybe that you didn't do or didn't get to do? Like, I wish I had been able to do that as I was going down this path. One thing that I wish I could have done, honestly, was become a company first sergeant. I, I never had the opportunity because my last duty station at Fort Riley, Kansas, I was an E8. And for the listeners out there that may or may not understand, to be a first sergeant, you have to be an E8. So a master sergeant and or a first sergeant for a company, it's the same pay grade, but the first sergeant of the company is, has the overall company responsibility with a company commander. So I wish I had that opportunity, but when I got to Fort Riley, Kansas, prior to my last deployment to Iraq, all the first sergeant positions had just been filled. They were all brand new positions. So those individuals, they, you know, they, it was basically first come first serve. And I guess I got there a little, maybe a month or two late. And so I retired as a master sergeant versus uh, a first sergeant. And I, I wish, I always tell my wife this, my current wife now, I always tell her, you know, I wish I could have taken that opportunity and, and maybe maybe even stayed a year or two longer and become a first sergeant. But uh, that, that'd be the only different path of journey I wish I, I could have done probably differently. Fair enough, fair enough. Nathan, if our listeners would like to learn more about you, your experience uh, in the 82nd and in the U.S. Army, the military, where is the best place for them to go to get to know you? Well, they can go directly to my website. My website is www.naganaga, and that's A-G-U-I-N-A-G-A dot com. And they can go directly to it, and they can purchase the book directly from the link on there as well. Fantastic. And we'll provide the, you know, the links back to your website, of course, your LinkedIn profile, that's how we met. Your book's on Amazon and some other platforms, so we'll provide at least a link to Amazon. Now, you're on Twitter as well? That's uh, correct. Okay. Uh, how are you liking that experience? Well, social media is a great, you know, a great journey. Uh, for instance, Facebook. I've been on Facebook since 2006. It's great to reconnect, you know, and, and I tell you, honestly, that's been my biggest way to promote promote division and possibly my other books coming out as well. It's just a, it's just a great opportunity to, to connect with people. And honestly, I appreciate, you know, without LinkedIn, I, you would have probably never found me. So I mean, I just, it's a great system. It's awesome. One more thing Absolutely. Be- before we end, and you've kind of alluded to some of this, you know, especially asking you, what would you tell the, you know, the young Nathan again, if you, if you could go back is what would advice would you give or insight would you give to our listeners for any or for anyone, whether you're contemplating the military as a career or you're, you know, maybe it's the, the you're talking to the spouse of somebody that's in the military or what advice or insight to go would you give to somebody? That's, you know, it could be a quote, a book, an idea that's kind of floating around. And I, God, I want to share that. One of the last statements I make in, in division is the 82nd is a sink or swim environment. Okay. I chose to swim. I choose to swim every day that I'm on this earth. And like I tell the students at school, if somebody ever tells you that you can't accomplish your own, your goals, that should make you upset enough where you go out and just make it happen. 
because those people are going to be out there your whole life. They're going to tell you, you can't accomplish this or you cannot accomplish that. And that should, that should just drive you enough right there to just go out and make it happen. I love that. I love that. And on that note, I think that is a fantastic way to end this episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Nathan, thank you so much for reaching out to us via LinkedIn and and responding to our message. And I think this your book is fascinating. And I, I know our listeners will be fascinated by this conversation and hopefully want to learn more about you and your work and go out, get a copy, read the book. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you very much, Howard. Thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And for your listeners out there, airborne all the way. Fantastic. I love it. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Nathan Aganaga. Nathan is a U.S. Army retired master sergeant and author of Division Life on our Dan Street. Do check him out on his website. We'll provide a link in our show notes, as well as on LinkedIn, links on Twitter, as well as on Facebook. And, you know, during the conversation, Nathan also acknowledged the uh, the conversations with his publisher, Kohler Books. So we'll put a, a link out to Kohler Books as well. So great podcast, a lot of very cool information. And I have to admit, prior to this uh, conversation with Nathan today, I did go out to Google, did my search on 82nd just so I could learn a little bit more about this uh, storied uh, division. And it's truly a calling card in what the uh, what Nathan and his peers and, and either today or you know before him uh, have been going through and helping to protect and defend this country. So wonderful podcast, and we thank Nathan for his time. And so folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.